The promises of God are out here. He's put them in His Word for us to strive for and look at. And we see the promise, we recognize that's for me. I want that, I need that in my life. I'm gonna take this spiritual gift of hope, I'm gonna th fling it out there, grab a hold of the promise, and through patience and endurance and believing and not throwing in the towel and not giving up, eventually, because I hope in this promise, it becomes my reality as long as I don't give up as long as I keep believing, as long as I hang on to the rope, don't let go of the rope of hope. Hang on to the rope and the promises that it's attached to because it will come to pass in God's perfect timing. Good morning, Trinity Church. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Everybody looks so happy, joyful. This is the sleeping crowd, right? Yeah, everybody's alive and awake today. Well, good morning. My name is Matthew Rowland. For those who I haven't met, and on behalf of our founding pastors, Joe and Nancy, I wanna thank you for joining with us here today. Whether you're in person or if you're watching with us online, we are thrilled to have you. It's a privilege to be alive today, to have the breath of life in us, that we could worship God another day and know him even more and know each other. We're so blessed and so privileged. Hey, for, for those of you who haven't met, I introduced myself. I also want to introduce you to my new friend, Michelangelo. Michelangelo, a budding artist, is 18 months old. And me and my family are gonna go out to Dollar Tree and Five Below and Aldi's and Walmart and everywhere else they got good toys because he is our Christmas angel. We're gonna spend at least 30 bucks and spend at least 30 minutes to go bring some hope and joy to this young man this Christmas. And he is one of many of the Christmas angels that are available right here on the patio. We've been partnering with Youth of the Mission of Dallas for 25 plus, maybe 30 years. It's been a long time. It's been a good time, a long, good time. We've been doing this together every Christmas, and I don't want you to miss out on the opportunity to fulfill someone's wishes and dreams and hopes this Christmas. If you have it in you, if you are willing and available, will you please stop by the patio and pick up the remaining angels? There's only a few left, but what we want to do is totally sell out all the angels and bring hope and life and encouragement. All you have to do is buy a few presents, wrap them up, bring them back in the bag that's provided, and they'll take care of the rest. There's also another opportunity on December 15th where we get to partner with YWAM and serve a meal to all these same families that are gonna be bringing their kids to pick up their Christmas presents. If you'd like to be involved, you can check it out on the website or buy the QR codes in your notes today, and I think you'll be glad you did. Can we pray together? Father, we remember your word that says, if we'll simply pause and acknowledge you, that you will guide and direct our steps. That's our prayer today. It's my prayer for each and every one of us in this room, everyone watching online, that as we worship together, ponder your words, hear this message, that there is a, there'll be something, there'll be at least one thing that each and every one of us can take away and apply to our lives so that we can grow as followers of Jesus, as disciples, make an impact in the world you've left us in. In Jesus' precious name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Way back in the 1950s, an experiment was conducted to see how long rats could swim. So a bunch of rats were gathered together and placed in different water buckets, too, too tall for them to be able to touch the bottom with their little tails, and the, top, the stopwatch was started. And, and the rats started swimming frantically for their lives. Five minutes go by, eight minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 13 minutes, they start to struggle. And the average rat made it about 15 minutes before they stopped swimming. Well, the same experiment was done a second time with one variation. So back in the water, the rats are swimming, five minutes, 10 minutes, 13 minutes elapses, and the experiment conductors pulled the rats out of the water, dried them off, gave them a little break, and stuck it back in the water. Now, what do you think happened once the rats went back in the water? They were probably discouraged, right? Wanted to give up, throw in the towel, right? No, they kept swimming. They kept swimming, you're right, they kept swimming, <laughs> kept swimming. They swam not just for another 15 minutes, not just two hours, not just five hours, they swam more than 24 hours. They swam more than 48 hours, more than two days. They made it all the way up to about 60 hours when on average the rats quit swimming. 60 hours, that's a long time. 
That little bit of a break, that little respite, that little drying off period, that little break gave them the super rat strength they needed to swim for almost 60 hours. It's pretty remarkable, huh? Just a little bit of hope, the thought that, okay, maybe I'll be rescued and saved again. May, may, I can just, if I could just hang on until I get pulled out of the water one more time. It's amazing what a little bit of hope will do for a rat. Now, my name is Matthew, but in high school, all my friends called me Matt. I went by Matt. Hey, Matt. Yeah, yeah. Except for one of my friends' mom gave me the nickname Rat. Because, yeah, from Matt to Rat, that's a whole book in itself. I gave my life to Jesus in vacation Bible school. I had a good run until about 10th grade, and then, oh, like I hit in, in February, you hit a patch of black ice. Your wheels start spinning. You go round and round. Who knows where it's going to go? That was me in high school. I hit, I hit a patch of ice, right? I got into a lot of trouble. It caused a lot of problems. Had a chaotic home life. Made some bad decisions. Needless to say, I was in trouble. And so Mrs. Anderson rightly named me Rat because that's what I was to her son. I got him in a lot of trouble. But my other friend, Jason, his dad, Al Nauman, had the nickname Big Al. He, he took a liking to me. I spent a lot of Saturday nights at Big Al's house, and I would try to sneak out Sunday morning, but he wouldn't let me go. He grabbed me, roused his son up, and he would drag us to church at Grace Church of Edina in Edina, Minnesota. And it was there over the course of time that the seeds of God's word were refreshed in my heart and my life. I was given a fresh vision for what God wanted me to do. I rededicated my life to the Lord. I got baptized in front of 3,000 people. It's a mega church there. And I got repurposed and reminded of the call of God on my life at 16 years old. I don't blame Mrs. Anderson at all, but I sure am thankful for Big Al and the investment he made in my life. He and his family lifted me up out of that water, dried me off, refocused me before I went back into the world and it's given me all the hope I need. I'm not just gonna swim for 60 hours, 60 months, 60 years. I'm gonna make it to the end because I have hope again in the promises of God and his call on my life. Now you're wondering, why is he talking all about himself? We're supposed to be here at church. Well, (laughs) believe it or not, it has everything to do with the message today. You see, today we're talking about hope. In the Advent season, we're going to focus on four virtues, beginning with hope. Today, we're going to talk about hope and the importance it has in our lives and what it means for us as believers. Next week, we're going to talk about peace. Pastor Derek is going to bring a message on the virtue of peace. Following that, we're going to talk about joy. Pastor Joe is going to bring the message on joy. And then finally, we're going to talk about the greatest of these, as Corinthians says, the virtue of love. This is, after all, the Advent season. This is the season where we fix our attention afresh and anew on Jesus, the coming Messiah who is promised that brings hope and joy and peace and love into the world. Advent simply means coming, approach, or arrival. And we're talking about the advent of the Messiah. This is a season of celebration. We're celebrating, for those who are believers, that Jesus has come into our hearts and to our lives that he rescued us, he saved us, he pulled us out of the mud and mire and put us on a track to live for God forever. We celebrate that reality. We also celebrate his eventual second coming, that he is coming again. This is a season of preparation. We're, now that we're saved and set free, we're gonna go about the business of being transformed in his, into his likeness. And he's gonna work on things and change character in us and get rid of bad habits and help us become more and more like Jesus, not because we have to, to get to heaven. He's already done the work, but because we get to, we get to become more and more like him and spread the hope and the joy and the peace and the love that he's put in our hearts. You know, it's a season of preparation, just like many of you are preparing your houses for Thanksgiving. I don't know about y'all, but we had my brother and his family down from Iowa. They spent four days with us. All I ever heard was about how great the Packers are. He's a Packers fan. (laughs) But we, you know, I blew off the walks from all the leaves and Jane was cleaning inside. We were doing all sorts of dragging out old mattresses from the attic, getting ready for our family to come as a season of preparation before their arrival for Thanksgiving. It's no different for us as believers. This reminds us of the preparation that we're going through as we anticipate Jesus' return. And it is that, it's an anticipation season. You know, if I was gonna go out to lunch with 
with uh, Governor Abbott, I'm gonna put on a sport coat and try to look nice, right? I put this coat on to remind me, put my mindset of, it's a season of anticipation, it's Advent. We're looking forward to Jesus' return. I might as well go ahead and light the candle here before I get, okay? So thank you so much, Melinda and the team, for getting these candles ready. This first candle represents hope. It's also known as the prophecy candle. Why do we have hope? Well, because God's given us all sorts of prophetic words and promises that we can count on, that we can bank on, that are going to come to fast, uh, going to come to pass. So each of these candles we light over the next several weeks. And it's also a reminder that Jesus' advent, his first arrival, brings light into the darkness. That shadow of death that we were all under from the beginning of time when Adam and Eve did what they did, this reminds us that Jesus has brought hope and light into the world. All right, so the title of the message today is Hope, but there is a subtitle. Subtitle is this, When You Wish Upon... No. When You Hope Upon The Star. The Star that is Jesus. Jesus is so powerful, so awesome, so mighty. He named himself... He said, I am the bright and morning star, Revelation 22, 16. Our hope is in the promises of God. Jesus is the word of God. We put our hope in him. He is the bright and morning star. Now, Cameron Steele, man of God, great faith and power, can fix all things media related. What is the last thing that Jesus said in Revelation that we have? What's the last promise he gave us? Last prophecy in this book. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming again. I'm coming soon, Jesus said. I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, is what John said. That's the last thing we read in Revelation 22 at the very end of the Bible. And here's the big idea I want us to all try to walk away with today before this message is all over. Here's the big idea. These prophecies or these promises of God are what fill his people, the followers of Jesus. These promises are what fills his people with everlasting hope. Humans need hope. Hope is not a wish. Hope is God's strategy to help us overcome in this world and prepare ourselves for the next one. The definition of hope is a strong desire for some good expectation to come to pass. We believe that we're going to obtain the thing that we have hope for. You see, faith and hope are nearly synonymous, but there's a slight difference. Faith is belief in the promises of God that have already come to pass. He said he'd take away my sins. He did that at the cross. That has happened. I believe it. I don't have to worry about being perfect anymore. I can put my faith in Jesus. That's all God wants out of me. He sees me through the lens of his son, the blood of Jesus. That is a finished work. I have faith in salvation. I have faith that I am a citizen of the heaven, a kingdom of heaven right now. It is a finished work. I have faith in these promises. But the difference between faith and hope is that hope is a belief in the promises that have yet come to pass, right? So faith and hope look very similar. We have faith in the things that have come to pass, the promises that have been fulfilled. We have hope for the promises that have yet to happen in our lives that come from Scripture. Prophecies in Scripture and the promises of God are what fill his people with hope. So this candle is called the prophecy candle. And it encourages us to look back at the prophetic words, the promises that God has given us through scripture that have already come to pass. So let's take a look in the book of Isaiah chapter seven. And everybody knows this passage very well. It says this, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means... God with us. That was prophesied by Isaiah hundreds, thousands of years before it came to pass. Isaiah goes on to say this in chapter nine, verse two, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned, referring to Jesus. God was speaking through Isaiah. Isaiah was speaking to the people. Don't lose hope. Don't give up. He's coming. The Messiah will be here. We don't know when. We don't know how, but he's coming. Hang on. Don't give up. Jesus is on the way. Isaiah 9, 6. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. What a relief that's going to be. 
No more political ads, no more polling to worry about, no more ballots to punch or mark. Jesus is going to take responsibility. That's it. Okay, you guys are done. Your time's up. Let me take it from here. What great news. Jesus will also be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of all peace and of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end. And somebody said, amen. So these prophecies concerning the Messiah fulfilled, filled God's people with anticipation, expectation, and hope. We see in one of Peter's letters, he described how the prophets were searching intently in the scriptures, in the word in the Old Testament for the time and the circumstances when this Messiah would arrive. They're looking through Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers for, for hints and clues and suggestions of when this advent would be. Isaiah prophesied, now, now when is it going to happen? These godly men, these prophets, these people that were anticipating this thing to happen, they believed it. Now when is it going to be? Peter describes that they were looking intently and with the greatest of care. The same thing, by the way, that the Magi were doing. The Magi in the east were looking at the stars and the heavens. They were trying to reference the scripture and see how these different changing celestial bodies add up to when the Messiah would come, which is interesting because the Bible itself says the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they proclaim knowledge. So there's something more than just the scripture. They were trying to add up how all this works together. And it wasn't just the Magi in the East. It was the angels in heaven that longed to see, to know, to understand. Peter says, even angels long to look into these things. They, they, they know they can't know the date, but they just really want to know when it's going to happen. But Jesus said, the Father doesn't know. The, oh no, the Father knows, the Son doesn't know, the angels don't know. They wanted to know. They were interested. They were curious because they knew why. Why were they so interested? Why were the godly men and women of those days so curious? Why did the angels want to know? Because all creation was broken. They themselves got it. They were oppressed. They were beaten down. They were discouraged. They wanted something to look forward to. They needed something to hang their lives on. They were in a broken world and things around them were desperate. They needed hope. They were living under the shadow of death. But they knew, they knew the Messiah was coming. They knew the arrival of Jesus would make all the difference. In the brief time that we have here left today, I want to talk about three aspects of hope, three realities of hope. The first one is this, and that's just that humans need hope. We need hope. We can't survive without it. God knows this. Even after Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, for their poor decisions. They needed hope. They needed something that would keep them going. You see, they were sentenced to death. They were promised labor in their work and in their childbirth. Their relationships were strained. They were no longer in paradise. Everything was messed up. They got it. Adam and Eve needed hope. Ancient Israel was in a similar plight. Her 400 years of oppression in Egypt they were crushed. They were expected to do things you couldn't physically normally do. They were in a difficult spot. They needed hope. They wandered in the desert. They needed hope. Their clothes wore out. Their leaders were corrupt. They disobeyed. They messed up their lives. They needed hope. In the dark ages, the mysticism and the disease and the, uh, the, the lack of being able to read and the uh, the, the wrong ways of thinking got a hold of the people. They needed hope. The world wars of the early 20th century left people in despair, sending their sons and daughters off to war, not knowing if they would ever see them again. The depression of the economy, what a desperate time it was. Those people needed hope. And today in our world, we still need hope. There's the constant threat of nuclear war in the Middle East. Another pandemic could break out at any time, inflation causing healthcare, houses, Christmas presents, all the skyrocket. We need hope. We need hope. If it wasn't, that wasn't obvious. And look at what Britain is discussing right now. It's in the news. They're debating back and forth in their houses of parliament whether or not they should allow for assisted dying laws to be accepted. And it looks like they're heading down that road. What an obvious sign that people are without hope and don't want to live anymore. Every generation 
Every nation since the beginning of time recognized or born into sin and depravity and brokenness, separated from God for all eternity unless some hope would arrive. Humans need hope. We need hope. But point number two, hope is not a wish. They are not the same thing. Hope is not a wish. In 1940, the movie Pinocchio came out and there's a song in it. Pastor Robert and I saw that movie when it came out in theaters. <laughs> song goes like this, Walt Disney or somebody wrote, when you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are. Do you want me to sing it? Would you recognize it? Careful what you wish for. When you wish upon a star, it makes no difference who you are. Anything your heart desires will come to you. Well, that's a pretty promise. Where'd they get that? Where did Walt Disney get that kind of power? Like a bolt out of the blue, fate steps in and sees you through. When you wish upon a star, your dreams come true, right? No, no, that's not how it works. Now, I get it. In 1940, when the movie came out, wars were going on. The world is about to be destroyed. The economy was a wreck. He was, he was trying to point somebody to something, give, putting a wish out there. Maybe if you wish, something will get better. I don't know. But he made a lot of money doing it, so his wishes came true. <laughs> but wishing has never worked for me or Daniel Twido. I mean, we've been wishing for the Vikings to win the Super Bowl for the last, I mean, for me, it's been 50 years. For you, it's like, what, 30 years? I mean, it hasn't worked for us yet. Baloney, wishing doesn't work. No more wishing, no more trying to get lucky, no more rabbit's feet, no more knocking on wood, no more scratching off hoping we win it all. You see, wishing is the devil's perverse take on God's idea of hope. Wishing is a worldly counterfeit. The devil knows we need something, but he doesn't want to point us to what God has for us. So he says, let me, let me get him wishing for things or dreaming about things and getting excited about maybe just they'll find a $100 bill on the ground or they'll pick the right stock and all their dreams will come true. Wishes are a worldly counterfeit, but hope, hope from God that's based on his promises will come to pass, will be fulfilled, will do what God intends for them to do. Hope is a desire for some good with the expectation of obtaining it. Whereas a wish is to feel or express a strong desire for something that's not easily attainable. To want something that probably will not happen. Insert the Vikings winning the Super Bowl. A hope and a wish are both a strong desire. See, they look the same. That's how the devil works, right? Take something, God just twists it slightly, just enough. So it looks like the real thing but it's not. A wish and a hope are both a strong desire. A wish and a hope are both outside of our control. We can't make it happen. We can't do it in our own strength. We need some supernatural power entity to pull it off for us. Neither of them can be fulfilled in our own strength. Wishes almost never come true, but hope from God will come to pass. It will be fulfilled. He will do what he says he's going to do. There's the difference. Wishes leave us disappointed, disillusioned, discouraged, and filled with doubt. But hope, godly hope, based on his promises, not our wants, not our desires, but on his word. Godly hope will fill us with encouragement, will bring us peace, and they will come to pass. Thank God that hope is not a wish. Amen? Hope is not a wish. Humans need hope. Hope is not a wish. Point number three, hope is God's strategy for us to help us overcome in this world and set us up for the world to come. Now, I know in business, hope is not a strategy. It's not a good idea, okay? Uh, now, there's a lot of great principles in the word we can learn and glean from and model our business after. Now, that's wise. That's good. But hope is not a great business strategy. But in the kingdom of God, hope is what we've got. Hope is God's strategy, and it's a necessary component for us as believers to overcome. So we want to look at hope like this. Hope is like a rope on your spiritual tool belt, okay? You, know, you got your tape measure, you got your writing pencil, you got your little saw or whatever, and you got hope in your spiritual tool belt. So the promises of God are out here. He's put them in his word for us to strive for and look at. 
and we see the promise, we recognize that's for me, I want that, I need that in my life, I'm gonna take this spiritual gift of hope, I'm gonna th- fling it out there, grab a hold of the promise, and through patience and endurance so and believing and not throwing in the towel and not giving up, eventually, because I hope in this promise, it becomes my reality, as long as I don't give up, as long as I keep believing, as long as I hang on to the rope, don't let go of the rope of hope, hang on to the rope and the promises that it's attached to, because it will come to pass in God's perfect timing. There's an evangelist that came to our church back in 2016, I think it was. His name is Nick Vojacic. Do you guys know who Nick Vojacic is? He is a remarkable and incredible person. His story is that when he was at a very young age, he thought very seriously, even tried to attempt suicide because of the circumstances he was born into. The gospel was preached to Nick. He received the gospel, became a follower of Jesus, And that set the trajectory of his life from that moment on. He's gone on to preach the gospel of the kingdom all around the globe to hundreds of thousands of people, if not more. Tens of thousands of people have given their lives to Jesus, responded to the message because of his testimony. Crazy thing about his testimony is that he was born with no arms and no legs. Now, Nick is a man of God who believes in the promises of God and knows that in the scripture, we're gonna receive a heavenly, renewed, restored body at some point, the other side of this world. He also knows that scriptures talk about how we serve and follow a God who heals, who delivers, who restores, who forgives. All these promises are for us to grab a hold of with our hope. So Nick has been asking and believing that someday his arms and legs will be restored. And he backs it up because he carries around with him all around the world a suitcase with a pair of shoes in it. Today could be the day I get my legs back. Today could be the day I see my miracle healing. Today could be the day that I'm walking on my own. But if not, I'm still gonna do and believe God and walk in the purposes that he's called me to. What a powerful example that is. We we aren't gonna take possession of all the promises of God in this book, this side of heaven. But Jesus still encouraged us and said, pray God's kingdom come, God's will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. So Jesus filled us with this expectation that the kingdom of God would come down to us and we would walk in it, we would represent that kingdom and we would see the manifestation of the kingdom of God this side of heaven, that these promises would come to pass. What's heaven look like? Is there joy in heaven? Is there peace? Is there life? Is there righteousness? Is there sadness? Is there pain? Is there brokenness? Are there tears? No, there's not. Jesus said, this is the world we're going to, but ask and live out right here on this earth, that same kind of heavenly world in front of you. That's what Jesus encouraged us to do. Take these promises and believe God for them. Jesus taught us to pray that way and believe that in this world, we'll see many of those promises come to pass. And where do we find these promises? Well, right here in the word, the word of God is where we see what God promised us. If you don't read the Bible, if you don't spend time investigating the promises, then you won't know what to attach your rope of hope to. The promises come from this word, not, be, not from what I feel, not from what I wish, not what I think is a good idea, but from what he said in his word. And I've got news for you. Whatever he promised is way better than we could think or imagine for ourselves. It's better to go right to the source to find, okay, what did God promise me? What can I believe for? What is the hope I should look to? My brain is gonna mess it up. Think of something ridiculous, you know? You know, God, I wanna be the best basketball player on the planet. Okay, that's a great idea, but you know, it's not in the word, so let's find something better, okay? God's got something better for us than being the best basketball or football player. I mean, yes, let's aspire to great things, but let's not put our hope in things that aren't in the word. Let's learn the Bible, read what it says, figure out what those promises are and start putting our hope on the promises that Jesus said in the word. What are some of those promises? Well, the biggest one of all is that he's gonna rescue us from sin, death, hell, and the grave. It starts right there. We don't have to worry about going to hell and spending an eternity separated from God. That's the number one promise. And it's true. He's given it to us. By faith, we receive it and we're thankful for it. 
What else has he said? Well, he said, we're gonna live an abundant life here on the earth, John 10, 10. That's what he wants us to believe for. You may not feel that in the moment. You may not see that in your circumstance, but that's a promise that Jesus gave us for this world, that we would live an abundant life. That doesn't mean we're gonna be the richest people on the planet or you know, whatever the dream is. It means we're gonna walk in joy and love and peace in our relationships, in our finances, in our job life, and the things that he has called us to do. He also promised that he would work all things together for the good of those who believe. I believe. So whatever my circumstances are, God allowed them to happen, but he said he's going to turn it for good. He's going to work it out where it's better. And if it's not good, that means he's not done. That's a promise I can hook my hope to and believe God for in this world. That's what he said. That's not my great idea. He's going to work all things together for good. That's a promise right here. I put my hope on that thing. I'm going to believe until that comes to pass. Second Peter 1 verse 3, he said, his divine power he's given to us for life and for godliness. Everything we need, everything you need for life and godliness, he's given you. That's what the Bible says. Whether for life, for my job, raising my kids, managing all the things that go with that, or for godliness, overcoming sin issues, developing new habits, sharing my faith with those who need it. He's given that to me. Do I believe it? Have I attached my rope of hope to that promise? Jesus promised us in this world, we would have the Holy Spirit with us and in us. The Holy Spirit brings joy, peace, life, patience. All those wonderful virtues come from the Holy Spirit. I may not be experiencing the fullness of it yet, but it's available to me if I'll just hold on to it with my rope of hope. He promised that all my needs would be supplied according to his riches and glory. Not my greeds, not my wishes, not my wants, but my needs. He promised that. If I don't have it right now, I need to get my rope of hope out, latch it to that promise and patiently endure until it comes to pass, because it will. And of course, he gave us the great promise that we looked at as we started our service together today, that he is coming again. He is coming again. He went away to prepare a room for you, for me, for all of his followers. But he's coming back to show us the way. He's excited to open the door and enter us and walk us in. He's excited for us to see the space that he's been planning for over 2,000 years. What a great thing to put our hope in and a reason for us to not give up, to not quit, to not throw in the towel, but to keep on believe and don't stop believing. C.S. Lewis had this to say about hope. Hope is a virtue. It's a continual looking forward to the eternal world. It's not a form of escapism or just hiding on a mountain with just our Bible and our Christian friends. That's not, that's not what hope is leading us to. It's not a form of wishful thinking, but it's one of the things a Christian is meant to do. We're meant to have hope. We're meant to look forward to the future. Without a vision, people perish. Hope is a vision for something more. We're meant to have vision for something beyond our current circumstances. That is the plan of God. It keeps us going, keeps us pressing. Uh, Lewis went on to say this, it does not mean that we're to leave the present world as it is. So we don't just hunker down and hide away. Christians who did the most for the present world are the ones who are most obsessed with the next world. Our hope in Jesus and what he does for us here and now should lead us to make a difference and an impact in the world we're currently living in. Not because we want perfection here, but because we wanna take as many people with us as possible into the next world. Jeremiah 29, 11, you all know the scripture, but it's good to be reminded of this today. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future, this coming from the God who's never done a wicked thing, never thought a wicked thought, never said an evil word for all time and all eternity. The God who loves us, who knows us, who made us because he wanted us. We're not just an afterthought. It took him eternity to decide, I'm ready, I want them. And now he intends to spend eternity with us forever. He wants us, he desires us. He looked down from heaven and he said, I don't have a Pamela, but I want a Pamela. I'm gonna make a Pamela. She's gonna love me and follow me and be with me forever. I can't wait for the next stage 
of this life. He said that about each and every person in this room. Paul understood this as he wrote from a Roman jail, verse 15, 13, or to the Romans rather. Paul said this, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. That's the catch. The joy and peace come from God as we trust in him. Don't expect to have joy and peace if you're not putting your trust in him. But if you'll do that, you will experience this joy and peace, a gift from the God of hope so that you may, here's the other catch, he wants you to be so full that you'll overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So not only does God want us to be encouraged and us to be full of hope and excited about the things to come and pressing forward to those things, he wants to have so much hope inside of us it overflows that we'll have enough to give to those around us who are so desperately in need of hope. That's the way God is, he's the God of abundance. He wants us to be full of hope for the promises and expectation of things to come. So much so that he wants us to encourage others in the same way, just like I am hopefully doing for you today. Now in closing, God wants our hope to overflow. He fills us with hope by giving us prophecies and promises that are going to come to pass. We can trust him because his character and his nature is flawless. He is good, he is God, and God is love. Humans need hope, hope is not a wish. Hope is God's strategy to help us overcome in this life and prepare us for the life to come, amen. Let's all stand together if you would. I'd like to invite our ministry team to the front. We wanna make ourselves available to you to pray for you and encourage you. Uh, These that are coming forward, they are full of the Holy Spirit, full of the Word of God. They love to lay hands on people, pray for them. And they've seen answered prayers come, encouragement come. We are available to help you. Don't leave today if you know you need prayer for something, for anything. Please take advantage of these folks that are coming forward before you leave today. Uh, A question I have for you before you leave is this. How are you gonna bring hope, that overflow? If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're walking in the promises, What are you gonna do during this Advent season to take the overflow that you have and give it away and give it away? What are you gonna do? It's something for us to ponder as we leave the service today. I've got one suggestion though. That is you can go outside and buy up the rest of these Christmas angels and bring some hope and joy and excitement to people like Michelangelo, the budding artist in his Spider-Man suit. There's a bunch of angels left. Please swing by the patio take you 30 minutes, a little bit more than $30, and you can make an impact with the overflow of hope that you have. Will you please bow your heads with me as we pray? One last question I have for us today with every head bowed and every eye closed. Today, you walked in here perhaps feeling hopeless, feeling discouraged with thoughts of, I can't do this anymore. Maybe you feel like you've been treading water and you don't see a rescuer in sight. If you feel at the end of your rope, ready to lay it down, will you just raise your hand? I wanna pray for you today. You can put your hands down. It's just a reality that life comes, frustrating things happen, disappointments arrive, promises are broken, people are cruel. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. If you're in a season, in a moment where you're ready to give up, we are gonna pray for you. We're believing now the Holy Spirit is gonna come and refresh you and encourage you and remind you the promises of God. So we do ask Holy Spirit that you would come, breathe a fresh breath of life. Would you move around this room to every heart that needs it, every mind, every person, that's struggling. Father, you know your children better than anybody else. And I'm asking, Holy Spirit, would you just co-breathe a breath of life, bring freshness, a newness, bring hope, bring encouragement, bring bring life, bring peace to those who need it most in the auditorium today. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bring to mind the promises that they know, the Bible verses they've memorized. I ask you to bring them back to life. You are the God who calls dead things alive. You're the God of creation who makes all things. Jesus said you would make all things new. Would you come and bring a new fleshly heart, a new spirit, a new refreshing to those today that are struggling. Meet them in this moment. Don't let them walk out of here 
discouraged, depressed, down and defeated, but instead would you come and just put the rope of hope back in their hands, fill them with joy and peace and a promise from God that they can believe you for in this hour. Let no person walk out of here today discouraged and down, but rather fill us all with a fresh measure of hope in your promises, in your word. Come Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Minister to your people. Come counselor. Presence of God, fill us afresh and anew. We need you. And we as a people determine we are going to put our hope in you, not the wishes of the world, not the great ideas in our head, but rather we determine to put our rope of hope on your promises. You are good. You're kind. You're loving. You're faithful. We worship you. We bless you today. And we thank you for this moment and this important reminder in the Advent season why we should have hope. Humans need hope. It's not a wish. Hope is your strategy. We hear you loud and clear. We thank you for fulfilling your promises, for being the God of yes and amen. Amen and amen. Thank you for coming to church today. Let's give the Lord a big round of applause. He is so good. He's with us. He's for his people. Now, please take advantage of these ministers are ready to pray for you. Whatever's going on, if you just want to say hi to one of our leaders and make a connection, we're here for you. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. Go get you an angel, and we'll see you next week for our next message in the Advent series.